I, I'd like to start by hearing a little bit about the religious and spiritual background of your childhood, how you think about that. Well, um, I grew up in uh, the Catholic religion in a large Irish Catholic family. I was the oldest daughter of nine children. Mm -hmm. And uh, all my mother's sisters had nine or ten kids, and my father's sisters and brothers had nine or ten kids. So I had l literally a uh, hundred first cousins, and oh. it was a it was a <laughs> tribal, a right. tribal childhood, um, <clears throat> and the Catholicism was at the center of it. Mm -hmm. um, we went to mass. We had a priest who lived at our house practically. You know, the priest who was at the dining room table every night for fifteen years, um, who was the president of the local Catholic college. Right. And he brought lots of wonderful people to our house to talk. You know, somebody came. We met wonderful John Howard Griffin. Remember John Howard Griffin? He Who wrote is that? Black Like Me. Oh, do you yeah. remember that book? Yeah, Black Like Me. He was a white man who dyed his he, skin and yes. cut his hair and went through the South as a black man and wrote about it. Yeah. We met Marshall McLuhan. We met all these wonderful people. Um, anyway, the church. Um, as a young girl, I was, it was a very important aspect of life to me, the part we can't see. Mm. The world inside the world mm. um, is always, since I was a girl, very important to me. Maybe it's central to me. And um, uh, I was bored by the parish church we went to, and I could tell that it was um, all too human. Um, and I was disappointed by the priest there several times. Uh, but I was lucky enough to go to a school, and I was dragged there, actually I didn't want to go, in seventh grade to the Academy of the Sacred Heart, which was run by the Madams of the Sacred Heart. My mother had gone to school there, her mother, all my aunts, and it was this old, old, old school um, where the nuns were so forward thinking. And it was the 60s, and they were way ahead of us uh, mm -hmm. in terms of understanding what theology had to do with social justice, um, service, questioning, authority. Um, and it was there that I began to appreciate that you know, spirituality could be um, rigorous, it could be uh, imaginative, um, and it, it was an essential part of living in the physical world hmm. through those women, really. Um, but mostly I love the stories and um, of the Old Testament or what the Torah and uh, the New Testament. And the stories are still extremely compelling to me. And somewhere I read that you, you had a copy of Lives of the Saints that was important to you. Well, didn't every girl, I mean, <laughs> every Catholic girl. I, and our house was a very large, uh, chaotic household. And sometimes you could lock yourself in the bathroom, although people would bang and bang on the door um, and sometimes pick the lock. Um, but I remember hours of being in the bathroom, bathtub, reading Lives of the Saints and, <laughs> and, and in the bubbles and, um, and just be riveted by these lives. I've actually been trying to write an essay about this. Mm -hmm. and, because for me, I believe, it was the only example I knew of women who were subjects of their own life. Mm, mm. Not objects, but subjects who were choosing their own life, were looking out from their own faces, who were deciding how they would live moment to moment. Mm. And there were very few examples of this around me um, in those days. Mm -hmm. You know, I was... It, it's also true that um, I mean we're talking here at a at a Benedictine monastery, a community of nuns mm -hmm. and of women, and I've thought a lot about over the years about you know that the choice to become a nun fifty years ago was a liberating choice in liberating. many ways, right? I mean these were women who were not going to follow the well worn path of mm -hmm. getting married and being mothers and not having another identity. And then also how many stories I've heard over the years, just like this one, by strong, creative people all over the world, you know, not just here in Africa and Europe, um, 
who were so formed by an education with sisters, with nuns, and now, you know, these communities are, oh. they're not growing, right? They're... Well, not only that, but they're being investigated. I mean, we could talk, right, we could talk about well, there's this that at length. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, how interestingly, yeah. how interesting that the Vatican decided to investigate the nun community at this moment in right, time, right. Um, because like nurses and doctors, you know, it's the women who do so much of the work in the world. Yes. This is nothing against the wonderful men who have are priests in the world and mm-hmm. who do wonderful work, but you know the women are always the ones who clean the clean up and put the dishes in the dishwasher and yeah. do the laundry. Um, well, I was just talking to with my students last week about Emily Dickinson and about her choice to live mm. at home, and uh, I went to see her house for the first time a few years ago, and I got it. I'm like, wow, who wouldn't? If you were a creative woman. What a marvelous house to live in. Gorgeous bedroom, light pouring in, large library, garden in the back. Um, And she was spared, you know, um, having to live a conventional life. She could live her life in her own terms and not die in childbirth, not uh, have to be working all day. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. You know, she got to have a contemplative life. Right. And she did work. I mean, she ran the house, but took care of her alien mother. But um, and the students kept saying, they kept wanting to make her odd. They said, no, she was. This is why women entered the nun nunneries. Yes. I mean, to have a life that was their own. Yeah. To have an independent life um, of the mind, of the heart, of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, in your childhood, and I've read a lot of, of it, other interviews you've given, and some of your writings, and I don't. Um, I don't see you talking about the roots of poetry there um, or of you being a poet. Is there any, any way you trace that? Well, I just found, I actually, um, I didn't know one could be a poet and live. You know, I didn't know. I, I, would, I read poetry and I would read the old Harvard classics we had in our living room. Mm-hmm. I would pour through these dusty books and try to find language that was adequate to experience or try to find language that could somehow hold the unsayable. And uh, some of the mass did that. Some of the, the, the re, you know, the parables mm, do that, yeah, uh-huh, you know. Uh-huh. I love the parables and the stories of, you know, Noah and Abraham and Isaac and all those great old stories. They've struck me as poems. Well, and many of them were written as poems, even if they weren't laid out that way right. in the King James Version. And they hold what cannot be said. They hold so much um, mystery and complexity. And it's a, a story is all there, but we know that the story, the real story, is, is in, uh, inarticulate. And, and I loved that. I love the spaces in between what happens. And... Um, and I would put on little Christmas plays for my family. Mm-hmm. I would make my brothers and sisters be in them. And um, <laughs> I did that too. I'm sure. <laughs> you know, the, the family. Because what's, you know, all these kids, what's there to do? We had a playroom. Everybody come on, let's put on a play. Yeah. And, and then over the years, they did become more um, sophisticated. Um, and the last play was when I was a Colombian getting an MFA and uh, earning an MFA. And, and I did write. Um, some sonnets uh, mm. for Mary and different people. We didn't act it out, but we all just said it. And that was the last Christmas play. It was really, really a joy to do. Um, but yeah. I didn't understand you could be a poet till I was about 30. And it's quite an amazing story of how you became a poet. A little bit later in life, you'd already embarked on another career. You took a summer class? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, I mean, that's, I was, there you go. Well, you know, it's like, again, it's now poetry is everywhere in the United States, mm. but this was in the 70s, and, you know, there were a handful of poets, uh, most, many of them male, right. um, who were publishing then. It was a very small group, and I was teaching high school in seventh and eighth grade, and but I found I was a terrible seventh and eighth grade teacher because all I wanted to do was read poetry or <laughs> Shakespeare, um, and um, I moved. I was living with a man uh, north of Boston, my old history professor from college, which is a whole other story. Mm. And um, I was 
teaching at this rural, big regional high school, and um, I would sit in the book room during my breaks and I would read to the anthologies, and they all ended right around 1950. Mm. So there'd be one poem by Anne Sexton, one poem by Sylvia Platt, one poem by Merwin, you know, and I'd be like, mm, you know, top of my head would come off. And, um, and then I, my father uh, died. He became very ill and died quickly within four months. And I went home to take care of him. I left the professor, who was a very uh, difficult man. And so suddenly, there's these huge changes that happened. And I was alone. And my father, it was the first huge death in my life. And I was reading The Once and Future King, that book. And Merlin says to Arthur, when you're very sad, the only thing to do is to go learn something. <laughs> so I, I called up my friend Dave Colley, who was the head of the department I worked for, and said, where can I learn something this summer? And he said, go to this thing at Dartmouth. It's called the Humanities Institute. It's a fellowship. You should apply to that. So I did. And, uh, and I, I was accepted, and I went. And you could take courses, and there was a writing workshop. But I thought, I'll take the philosophy course, but I'll just sit in and let's, I'll just go see what it's like. I mean, I went, and... There were all these people, and the teacher, Karen Pels, um, who's no longer alive. God bless her. She, she, we all went around the way you do in a class to say who you are and why you're there. And I said, well, I'm just sitting in. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stay. And then and she said, when everyone was finished, she said, well, my name is Karen Pels, and I'm writing my spiritual autobiography. And I just blurted out, who are you to do such a thing? <laughs> and she said, I'm a poet. I'm a lyric poet. I said, well, I want to do that. And she said, then stay. Mm. And I did. And, um, and you did, and it changed your life, and it changed, it changed American poetry. Well, I was so fortunate because she was such a good teacher and so generous, and, and the people in the class began handing me books, contemporary poets, and, and then I... I went to her, I was about to turn 30, and I said, you have to tell me whether I should continue this. You know, I need you to be honest with me, you know, really. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you should go get an MFA. And I said, what's an MFA? Mm-hmm. She said, you go to graduate school, and you study poetry, and you write a book. I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. I couldn't even believe such a thing existed. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there were a number of other steps, but eventually I went to Columbia. And so... You know, I think a lot about um, there's there's something strange about um, I, I notice in myself, and when we put poetry on the air, it's like a hunger people have had, but they've forgotten. Beautiful they don't thing. know they're starving for it. They mm-hmm. don't know they need it. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if because you came to poetry as a profession a little bit later in life, I wonder if you. You know what? What? How you experienced and thought about? You know what is it about poetry that we can't do with other kinds of language, and what what need is it sating in us? How do you think about that? Well, you know, I'm not. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I think it's sort of what we were talking about with the stories. Poetry holds, it's like a, you can hold what can't be said. It can't be paraphrased, it can't be translated. Because a lot of what it's holding isn't in the, isn't, it's, it's in between the words. It's, um, mm. there's, and it's a song, too. We, we, we hunger for the song. Mm. Um, but the, the great poetry I love um, uh, holds uh, the mystery. Um, of being alive, uh, and uh, it, it, it holds it in a kind of basket that of words that uh, feels inevitable. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's great, great, great prose. You know, it's gorgeous prose. You and I could probably quote some right now. Yeah. Um, there's great, great, great plays. You know, there's. Um, but poetry has a kind of, how do we say, kind of a trance-like quality still. It has the quality of a spell mm. still, mm. you know. Um, I think that's a really interesting analogy that 
in some ways, poetry may be as much akin to music and song mm -hmm. as it is to prose. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. And, and that it touches some of the same places in us. Yeah, and that are, that, are, that are inarticulate and that are unconscious um, because of the rhythms. Mm -hmm. It is incantatory. It is, it is the spell, you know. It's, my daughter came home one day and she said, she did this whole snappy thing, you know, don't make me snap my fingers in a Z formation, explanation, talk to the hand, talk to the wrist, ooh, girl, you just got this. And it's this whole thing, you know, the girls <laughs> were doing when they yeah. were 11. And I said, a counterspell. It was like a counterspell for a mean girl, you know? Yeah. And, and, in, and then I thought, this is what we all need to walk around with, a handful of counterspells, you know? And, and poetry, when you think of its roots, you know, is that I mean it's it is a sacred art, and um, it was and it's almost it's magic making magic with words. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, maybe the first poem was a lullaby a woman sang to her child. You know, the incantatory mm -hmm. "everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay." I'm here, go to sleep, um, or we we prayed for rain, or we we thank the gods for the corn, or we. We, we sang to the to the deer we were going to catch, but there's a there's it's it's relational, it's interrelational, it's incantatory. It it feels as its roots can never wholly been, be pulled out from sacred ground. Mm, mm, you know, mm. prose can be gorgeous, and um, but it doesn't have its roots in the sacred. Mm. You know, and I feel the poetry does. So I wonder if you would read um, this poem, The Meadow. Oh, gosh, sure. It's a long, um, it's an old poem. Is it? it, is yeah. it it's in The Good Thief, The Good Thief, right? yeah, the first book. Page nine. Yeah, sure. This is a great, this is a really interesting poem that you asked me to read. The Meadow. <clears throat> As we walk into words, that have waited for us to enter them. So the meadow, muddy with dreams, is gathering itself together and trying with difficulty to remember how to make wildflowers, imperceptibly heaving with the old impatience it knows for certain that two horses walk upon it, weary of hay. The horses, sway-backed and self-important, cannot design how the small white pony mysteriously escapes the fence every day. This is the miracle just beyond their heavy-headed grasp, and they turn from his nuzzling with irritation. Everything is crying out. Two crows rising from the hill fight and caw cry in mid-flight, then fall and light on the meadow grass, bewildered by their weight. A dozen wasps drone, tiny prop planes, sputtering into a field the farmer has not yet plowed. And what I thought was a phone, turned down and ringing, is the knock of a woodpecker. For food or warning, I can't say. I want to add my cry to those who would speak for the sound alone. But in this world, where something is always listening, even murmuring has meaning, as in the next room you moan in your sleep, turning into late morning. My love, this might be all we know of forgiveness, this small time when you can forget what you are. There will come a day when the meadow will think suddenly, water, root, blossom, through no fault of its own. And the horses will lie down in daisies and clover, bedeviled, human. Your plight in waking is to choose from the words that even now sleep on your tongue and to know that tangled among them and terribly new is the sentence that could change your life. I really, really love that, those last lines, you know. Bedeviled human, your plight in waking is to choose from the words that even now sleep on your tongue 
and to know that tangled among them and terribly new is the sentence that could change your life. I mean, what a wonderful way to think about the power of language mm -hmm. and the mystery of it, where it comes from in us. Well, language is almost all we have left of action in the modern world. Mm. I mean, unless we're in Syria, you know, or we're in Iraq, or, but for many of us, action has become what we say mm. and what we think. Um, moral, the moral life is lived out in what we say more often than what we do, it seems. Mm. I'm not sure we're very conscious about that, self-conscious about mm -hmm. it. It's a provocative thought. What we say. Um, so you're, you're writing about, and your poetry, about, um, about your brother's death. Uh -huh. It's something that has been really very important for many people. And you've done a lot of of, um, I mean, you've been interviewed a lot about that. And I want to talk a little bit about John, but, but I think what intrigued me more as I started really steeping in your work is the context in which you wrote about your brother's death is you, you've, you've written, you've always written a lot about family uh -huh. and families. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, uh, and, and, and you've put poetry to family or you've put family to poetry. Mm-hmm. Well, it's where the, it's the stage, you know. It's from, what? It's the stage. For, the family is the stage where so much happens. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's where so much happens in our lives. The family of origin and then our family of friends or children or yes. whatever. I mean, it's where everything happens. And I had, you know, there were 11 people in my family and a lot happened. Yeah. Um, any given day. <laughs> <laughs> There was a great deal going on, because everybody had about three or four friends over, too. So. Right. So that makes for what? 28? Many, people. many people. <laughs> I mean, I, I, wish, I wish I were a playwright, because the play I would want to write is, I want to just have a big house, have a big stage for all different floors, and a basement. And so you've got all these things going on that people are not aware of, right. you know? <laughs> and the priests in the living room drinking their scotch, and... You know, the boys downstairs playing pool and the kids in the backyard. There's just, it's just, I mean, sometimes there'd be 40, 50 people over. No big deal, you know. And, you know, there are these lines of poetry where, um, again, where you, you, turn, you turn these ordinary things into poetry. Like, I think this is from the Gov Grovner Road poem. You know, it's, it's lines of poetry about plumbing and uh -huh. the kitchen cupboard where we kept monop monopoly and life with all <laughs> those, those pieces, pieces missing. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, uh, which you don't have to have had a family of forty people around to have experienced. There's, there's something really. Uh, it, it 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 makes me. I have to say, it makes it made me almost envious. It's kind of like, as you say, I almost think as we get older, we can become more painfully aware of how we don't leave our families of origin behind, mm -hmm. and and it's kind of like because you have poetry to work with on that, it's almost like you, I don't know, I kept thinking it was like you had Play-Doh for, mm -hmm. for uh, working with ancestral familial memory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, my life is so different from that life. I mean, I'm raising my daughter by myself in a tiny rent And there's only one of her. There's one of her <laughs> and one of me. Yeah. And we're in a tiny rent stabilized apartment in New York in the Greenwich Village, which would be not even considered a room, you know, in my family of origins house. I mean, it, it's, it's such a different life um, in many ways. Um, yeah, to have that kind of attention. You know, no one ever got enough attention yes. with all those people. So. Are you really aware of that, of how, much, how present you were able to be to her? Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, you know, I sometimes, I, I, you know, I say to her, you know, when I, when, I, when I forget myself, I'll say, you just need a few days with my brothers and sisters, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, because she's, uh, she's a sensitive child who's used to an adult attending to her, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and so I can never kid with her, for example. I grew up into such heavy sarcasm. Um, mm -hmm. 
which I, it took years to get over, but, but uh, you know, you never got it straight. You know, it was also the Irish Catholic thing, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm, and, and your, I wouldn't, your poetry isn't, there's no kind of tell-all no. what happened in my family, but there are glimpses of, yeah. of the kinds of trauma and drama. Well, whenever 11 people are living together mm-hmm. in any place, anywhere, in this monastery, mm-hmm. I'm sure yeah. there are there are dr- dramas, you know. And mm-hmm. people in my family were afflicted by the disease of alcoholism, which brings a terrible chaos into a, a home as well. Um, and they struggled with that disease, and um, so that that added a lot to. Mm-hmm. Um, and your father, in particular, my father and my mother actually, but we didn't really even know that. But everybody, everybody, it seemed the the priests, you know, at, at pretty, mm-hmm. it was pretty alcoholic culture. Um, I don't mean drinking, I mean alcoholic. And, but, but nobody knew, and they tried, you know, my, or my father did, and he actually struggled very hard to, to deal with his disease, but he couldn't. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, that brings all that in, too. Um, so you have, you know, things get violent, or things become very dramatic, and, um, but that happens in so many places, so many families. Ours is no different. Right, and and in writing about it in a in a very particular way, then you still are able to speak to these universal experiences of family. I want to ask you about a line that was in a poem called "Letter to My Sister." Oh dear, uh huh. This no one told us. Yeah. There is no such thing as family, and somehow, somehow that rings true to me, despite what we've just said. Mm. But I want to. Oh, I'd like to ask you what what you mean when you say that when you write that. Well, that poem was written to a sister who, um, you know, in a big house, different people experience different things, and depending where you are in the age, you know, every there were eleven of us. There are eleven stories of what happened in our house, and then there are eleven stories about those stories, and there are eleven mm-hmm. more versions and 11 more. So um, I want to make that very clear. And one of the things that I grew up understanding was that multiplicity of viewpoints Mm. and truths. Um, Which is actually a useful perspective on the rest of life. Very useful because, uh, you know, one has to see that there are so many different stories about any one given incident. And some people have said it never happened at all. And they could be right. <laughs> so, you know, it's... it's yeah. um, but that particular poem was to my sister, a sister who I love very much, um, who uh, was experiencing trauma and r- trying to speak to how, in our case, I think alcoholism shatters uh, unity. Um, uh, that it, it can fragment a community so that you are now in separate uh, shards. Mm. Um, mm. And as much as you want to be all in the same room, the nature of that illness fragments um, and sh- into shards any unifying understanding uh, or even experience. So um, I think that's, that's what those lines were trying to say, mm. you know, that I don't really believe that anymore, but in that case... I think that one sister is trying to speak to another from that fragmentation. Mm, mm, That's really interesting. You know, shard to shard. Shard to shard. And your brother John was 11 years apart from you in age. Yep, Johnny was younger than I was, Mm -hmm. but I, from really the beginning, it seems like the minute he was born, we were intimate. um, Intimate friends. You said you've called him your spiritual teacher. Yeah, he was. If he were here, he would laugh. But, um, you know, he was so beautiful. I love all my brothers and sisters so much. And, and, and John and I just had that kinship. A lot of people did with John. He was charismatic and hmm. very uh, charismatic, very empathetic, very imaginative, very amazing guy. But um, even when he was little, I was... Um, I was going through a lot in my 20s, um, having a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, depression, really struggling through my 20s. And I would have these panic attacks. And I would 
asked my brother John just to walk me around the block. And he would just jump up from the chair in front of the TV and go, okay. And he didn't even know what we were doing, but he would just go with me everywhere. Hmm. Or I was afraid to drive alone. And my brother Andrew, too, he was very much, he was four years younger than John. The two of those boys, the three of us hung out a lot. Hmm. So I might be, let me see, if I was 22, Johnny would be nine. Andy would be, <laughs> Andy would be like, Five. Yeah. So it'd be me and these boys <laughs> walking very fast around these big suburban blocks. And they had no idea that I was like, <clears throat> you know, and I didn't know what was happening. But um, so they hung out with me all the time. And Johnny and I would write the Christmas plays together. He'd come up in my attic room and I'd be like writing doggerel, really, like rhymed stuff. And he would, be, he would help me. And, um, and then he grew, and, and so then by the time I was um, uh, in my 30s, he was in his 20s, and um, he, he also got sober before anybody in my family did. He got mm. sober at 23 mm. and um, came to live with me after that uh, for the summer up in uh, Woodstock, Vermont, where the meadow was written, actually. Mm. Um, and uh, he lived for five more years and died at 28 uh, from complications from the AIDS virus. And um, so what year did he die? Uh, 89. Yeah. So that's when people died. Right. That was the, the, that window of time where AIDS was a fatal illness. And people died fast, Yes. often, very yes. fast. And Johnny died once and then came back. He actually had one of those near-death experiences. Mm. He, he died. He had pneumocystis pneumonia, which was what was killing people so quickly. And he was on, he died, and he came back from the dead. And the doctors and nurses couldn't explain it. No. When, you, when you think back now, and you've, you've got some distance from that, I mean, it's not like AIDS has gone away. It's still something we're grappling with and we'll continue to grapple with. But, but there was that moment. Yeah. And, you know, how do you think about what you learned and what we learned as a culture through that beginning of AIDS? Well, as an American culture, we learned a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. I think we learned, you know, you know, I mean, when you think of our culture after World War II and the ride, you know, that ride into prosperity and, you know, everything is going to be great and it's going to keep building and building and building and, and then all these young men, and it was young men in the beginning, were struck down, 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 down. And you know, this sort of sense of mortality just pushing its face into the shiny American culture and saying, you know, here too, not just Delhi, not just, you right, know, right. here, you know, and on the wide suburban streets and the mowed lawns. I mean, Johnny lived with his partner in Rochester, New York, but my mother, on my mother's street, which was one of those big, wide, old suburban streets, young men were coming home to die in their bedrooms, you know. Mm alone, mm. with their cowboy curtains mm. Mm. there, you know. Mm. And, and my mom actually started a mother's AIDS group. Um, she just met with two other women. And in both cases, the husbands, the fathers, wouldn't even speak to their sons, you know. So these, these men are up in their bedrooms, and the, the mothers are carrying the trays up, you know. It's just going on. Mm. Yeah. Um, and... So there was all that shame and com confusion about sexuality and homosexuality, and it was all mixed in. Now, we, of course, we know it's just a virus, like everything else, but mm. it's just typhoid. It's just malaria, you know. Um, but uh, I think it brought mortality, and it brought also that sense of being, you know, uh, finitude. Yes. I mean, to a generation... Right, of people that had known no fear. Right, we hadn't had a war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We hadn't had. I mean, I think about nine eleven as one of those moments too. But you're right, AIDS was AIDS was also one of those moments. And and and, the, and then it, and then it first attacked the gay community, which was just coming into its identity and its mm -hmm. strength. You know, after Stonewall, mm -hmm. and such a creative community. I mean, Broadway demolished, you know, all this creative community of beauty, uh, and where beauty is so important. And, you know, I think that it's no coincidence, I think, that 
And there's been this sort of hunger since the 80s, what we call it new age now, but this hunger for something besides the surface values, mm. you know. I feel like AIDS brought, reminded us. That and it was very new and flailing at that point, too, when you think about new age. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that, um, I mean, I think my brother and watching his friends die, and the way they all knew they would all die. And they knew they would be at each other's funerals. And they, that, hmm. that, when they looked at each other, the way they loved each other through that was mm -hmm. extraordinary. Um, so, you know, there's this phrase that you, it's, well, it's in one of the titles of one of your collections, The Kingdom of Ordinary Time. It's a, it's a, it's a phrase from religious ritual. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that um, a lot of the really pivotal stories of you, that you tell of moments with John of revelation for you are about sinking into ordinary yeah. time. Yeah, it was Johnny, too. Yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and I, I, the whole subject of time yeah. is fascinating. I mean, how, I, I wonder what you, what you learned about time through that experience with him and, and beyond. How do you think about that? Well, you know, I got to be with John uh, the last month, or six weeks or so. I left teaching and came home, and I got to be with him full time. Um, and those hours, getting to be with him and just hanging out, you know, were such a joy. And um, how do I say this? I mean, I, it seems better here in Minnesota, <laughs> but in New York, it's, busyness is an affliction. It's an affliction. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. N no one can even make a plan with anyone for like a week, to four weeks from Thursday. <laughs> you know? it, but it, it happens in Minnesota too. It's awful. Yeah. When did this happen? It's absurd. It's, it's actually absurd. absurd. And yeah. we keep saying it's absurd and hiding it. I always stop it. And, um, so there was a tremendous relief of just being there with him and Joe, his partner, and Dorothy Allen, who came to help, and my mom. And people would come and go, and the shade would flop against the window, and Johnny would sleep and wake and sleep and wake. And we would tell each other stories, you know. Mm -hmm. We would tell the stories forever. And just to no, be... Stories about your childhood, stories, what everything. about? Everything. Like, you know, John, was, John would be in great pain. Um, and I had never seen anyone. My dad had died uh, with, you know, from cancer. But, you know, he it was it was a pretty easy not easy. Forgive me, Dad. But it seemed like a, a what they call a good death. You know, he it was. Uh, but but Johnny, you know, he had his eyes were uh, exploded in his head. He had neuropathy. He couldn't walk. He was ninety pounds. He was skeletal. You know, he was. A lot of pain. He 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 wouldn't say that, but he was, and he would take the pills, but it, it, but he would be in so much pain until they really began to work. And he would say, "Marie, just tell me tell me some stories." So I would do anything. I would tell stories from the past. That we we would tell the let's tell the story of the prodigal son. Let's tell the you know <laughs> or, or okay here's what I just read about Paul McCartney. Anything, right? Because we'd always done that our whole life. Just tell stories. I mean. The best part of our, our adult, my adolescence, was coming home. We all went out at night, you know, to our different places. And we would come home, and we'd then we'd hang out in the kitchen and wait for each other to come home. And one, two in the morning, everybody would be there, and then we would reenact what had happened that night, whatever it was. <laughs> and that was actually the funnest part of the whole night. And John was the best at it. But, so you would be eating cereal, you know, <laughs> and, and the kitchen door would be open and closed. People would come in and say, what? How did yeah. it go? And then we'd go, okay, well, I got there. This car was there. These no, are the kinds you know. of stories that make everyone wish they'd grown up in a family with eight brothers and yeah. sisters. Yeah, yeah, this part. And, yeah. and, and, and I loved that part. And um, it was better than going out, was hanging out late at night and hearing about that, what happened. But um, so we would just talk, and we'd just talk. And, and then Johnny, I would watch him just you know, rise on this wave of pain and, and, and then, you know, it might be 20 minutes and finally it would begin to subside and then he would look at me and go, well, we got through that one, didn't we? Hmm. You know. 
Now, what were you saying? What happened to the elephants? What were we talking about? Oh, yeah, you know, like, so he would go, yeah. you know, and it was just, he was a talker. Right. You know, that bridge one makes talking. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. Well, being present. In t- time. And being present is in that, time. Is that, the, is that really what it came down to, what it comes down to, what you learned? It seems is like that that's all I, we, everybody's saying now, and it's true. Yeah, I know. I everybody mean, is saying it now. We've discovered it. But it really is true. And Johnny, that, that little poem where John says, this is what you've been waiting for. Yeah. And I say, what? And he says, this. And I go, what? And he says, yeah. this cheese and mustard sandwich, you know, or this cup of tea. I'm like, what? And he's like, this. This is what you've been waiting for. Stop waiting. Yeah. This. Yeah. What, what is that? When I wrote that down, which poem is that? I think it's called The Gate. Do you want to read it? Do you I want have to no find idea. It? I almost know it by heart. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I also, I also did make that note. Your brother, this is what you've been waiting for. What? This. He was so funny, you know. Um, the Gate. I had no idea that the gate I would step through to finally enter this world would be the space my brother's body made. He was a little taller than me, a young man, but grown, himself by then, done at 28, having folded every sheet, rinsed every glass he would ever rinse under the cold and running water. This is what you have been waiting for, he used to say to me. And I would say, what? And he would say, this, holding up my cheese and mustard sandwich. And I'd say, what? And he'd say, this, sort of looking around. Hmm. That also echoes something else that really struck me. Um, So here's another line from Nowhere. From Nowhere, yeah. Yeah. This is how things happen, oh, yeah. cup by cup, familiar gesture after gesture. What else can we know of safety or of fruitfulness? Mm-hmm. What struck me in that, and also in the piece you just read, there's that, there are those tiny rituals of life in there. What, what was mm-hmm. it? Folding sheets, washing. Yeah, rinsing the glass under the water. It strikes me that these rituals of ordinary time themselves are a little bit like poetry. Mm -hmm. These condensed kind of economical little packets of beauty and grace that carry so much more forward than than is obvious. Well, I'm looking at your water glass now, you know, and it's shining, you know. I mean, it really is. And um, to slow down enough to just simply be there, it helps, you know, to to have a, a... people around to remind you. Now it's my daughter. You mm-hmm. know? She used to say to me, we would be driving in the car and she would say, Mom, slow down. If you slow down, you're going to get there faster. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, just watch. See that white car? Slow down. And then we would get to the place she goes through to pay the dollar or whatever it is. And she'd say, see, the white car's behind us. She was, she was always <laughs> doing it. She's a little Buddha, you know. Sometimes I look at her and go, who are you? Are you, John? Who are you? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, who I know you've talked with, um, says, you know, when you wash the dishes, wash it as if it were the baby Buddha or the baby Jesus, you know. Yeah. And um, I have a vase, a green vase, that my friend Billy's ashes were in. And um, when we have flowers, which we do all the time, because it's New York and everybody has flowers, because you have to have flowers, and the, the delis sell them, and they're so cheap. I always wash out that green vase once a week, and I feel like it's that is Billy's body, you know. Mm. Um, was it, well, that's what the church used to be. I mean, it used to be that we would attend these things every week that would remind us of these, you know, the sacredness of the everyday, and it's harder to find it now. Yeah. Did you ever read Brother Lawrence, The Practice of the Presence of God? No, I want to. Now. It's one of these old mystical texts, uh-huh. and it was also about that. It's about, it's about prayer as partaking in simplicity. Well, there's Saint a Teresa. lot in there about washing the dishes. So yeah. they're, they're, I have to read it. I you do? Say, when I was yeah. a girl, St. Teresa and her practice of dailiness, uh-huh. 
And my father was sometimes extreme in his um, demands on us. And for a while, he was quite extreme with me. So I would have to go to the backyard and pick up every cigarette butt between the patio things, or I'd have to go do this, you know. And I would think of St. Teresa, I'm not kidding, and say, just do every act as a prayer, um, which I could do for a while. Then my father would come out and say, you missed this one, this one, and this one, and it was hard. But, but yes, I'll look at Brother Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that everything in the Western world is trying to tell us this now, even as we're speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and staring into our screens. Um, it hurts to be present, though, you know. I ask my students every week to write 10 observations of the actual world. It's very hard for them. Really? They really find it hard. What do you mean? What is the assignment? 10 observations of the actual Just world? Just tell me what you saw this morning. Look in two lines. You know, I saw a, a water glass you know, um, on a brown tablecloth, um, and the light came through it in three places. So, you know, no metaphor. And to resist metaphor is very difficult because you have to actually endure the thing itself, mm. which hurts us for some reason. Mm. It does. It hurts You're us. You're naming something. We want, to, we want to say, it was like this, it was like that. We want to look away and, and to be to be with a glass of water or to be with anything. And then they say, well, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing important enough. And that, and I say, then that's the whole thing. That's the <laughs> point. That it, it's the this, right? right? It's the this, whatever yeah. it is. And then, and then, they, then they say, oh, I saw a lot of people who really want, no, 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 no abstractions, no interpretation. But then this amazing thing happens, Krista. The fourth week or so, they come in. And clinkety, clank, 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 onto the table pours all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it is so thrilling. I mean, it is thrilling. Everybody can feel it. Everyone's just like, wow, you know. The slice of an apple and the gleam of the knife and the sound of the trash can closing and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the maple tree outside and the blue jay. And, and all those comes clanking into the room. And it just, it's just amazing, you know. Um, you know, in some basic level, what they've done is just engage with their senses. Yeah, and, and have been present out of their minds mm -hmm. and just noticing what's around them, which is, we don't do. And, not to, and again, not to compare it to anything. They're not allowed, and that's very hard for them. And then on the sixth, fifth or sixth week, I say, okay, use metaphors, and they don't want to. They don't know how. <laughs> so like, why would I? Why would I compare that to anything when it's itself? Mm -hmm. like, Exactly. Mm. Good question. You know, and then so then you think, well, why the necessity of a metaphor? Why why do you have to use a metaphor now? You know, not just to do it to avoid it, but to do it to make it more there. How you know why? What kind of metaphor would that be? Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting. Say some more about why it hurts. I mean, I I remember I interviewed Elizabeth Alexander once, and I I said to her, poetry. I experienced poetry to hurt. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love poetry, and I often have to force myself to read it. And if I don't feel strong enough or vulnerable enough, yeah, um, I, I can't. I can't do it. Yeah. And it is that hurt. Muriel Ruckheiser wrote a whole book about this. She talked about the fear of poetry. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of people say, "Oh, I don't get poetry," um, because it it asks us to be present in a way that we find uncomfortable. Um, but ultimately, wonderfully fulfilling. Mm -hmm. What is akin to that? I mean, you don't say, okay, I'm gonna sit down, I'm just gonna make you listen to some rock and roll, you know? I mean, everybody wants to hear music, everybody wants to, well, what is it? It's it, There's some threshold you, you have to cross, or something, um, and yet, the the, large, the most important junctures of our life, we reach for poems. Right. When we get married, when someone dies. Yeah, absolutely. When a child is born. But if you think, I mean, music is a, it's another good example. It's similar in some ways, but you're right. It doesn't feel as hard. And, but it doesn't, I mean, poetry does 
there is this cerebral, there is this thinking part to it, but it's not just thinking. You have to connect the thinking to yeah. these places in you that feel, whereas with music you can, I'm just thinking out loud, you can give yourself over to the feeling. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's made of the material we use every day. Uh -huh. um, you know, the language we right. use every day, too, but in a different way. So there is some, maybe there's something to that. Um, it's very interesting. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm right now talking to people in New York State, because I've just been made New York State poet, which is very funny to me. Poet laureate. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you, but it's odd. It's an odd thing. But, <laughs> but what I want is to try to make poetry as um, ubiquitous as gap ads. I mean, how can we uh -huh. have people bump into poetry? Um, and we already have poetry in motion in New York on the subways, which is great. But I'm thinking of like where my sisters live, in Rochester or in Schenectady or Utica or you know places where... And so we're, 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 tr we're meeting with someone in two weeks, and we're trying to figure out a way to project poems onto buildings um, throughout the state. Mm. So the people just can look up when they're driving or walking and just see a poem projected um, on a building and maybe find a way to do that cheaply and to change it. Um, because when people find a poem, they're, they're so glad they do. Yes, it's a gift. Do, you know? Um, I was just in Washington, for the f and I took my son, who's about the same age as your daughter. Yeah. And he hadn't been there before, so I went. I went back to places I'd visited, like the Library of Congress, and uh -huh. look for the Library of Congress. I don't know that I ever noticed this before. There, uh, uh, the walls are ringed with these sentences. They're aphorisms and kind of hmm. wisdom sayings and poetry. I didn't know that. Yeah. And they're very beautiful hmm. and nourishing. Yes, that's the word. And what struck me is there they are in this iconic place of our, of, I mean, not just our culture, but our government, yeah. our foundation as a nation. Yeah. And, and it made me aware that we don't, we don't ha have those connections now. To, to, to that kind of language, like, you know. But it, we it's could. what you're talking about. Yeah, right. we could. I mean, right. there's this guy in New York. I say it's a guy. It could be a woman. Um, last spring, there was, there was somebody who was drawing on the sidewalk in blue chalk, and all it said was happiness, a big happiness with a big blue arrow this way. <laughs> and you would, like, look, and you would, like, look down the sidewalk, like, that way? And it was thrilling to see, hap oh, that's where it is. It's that way, happiness. I would see these around, and I thought, this is terrific. This is really kind of wonderful. Like, happiness is this way or that way. And then one day, I was waiting for my daughter and her friends to get off one bus, and we were going to get on another. And there was a big blue chalk, and it said, happiness. And then there was a big circle drawn on the sidewalk, and it said, here. And everybody who walked by stood in the circle. <laughs> <laughs> we did too. That's the this again, right? It's, it's the this. The, it's whatever. It's, that is, this right is right the, in front the of whole you. thing is the this, uh -huh. right? And it was like, and you stood in that circle and you felt great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Here's where it is, the thisness. Uh -huh. Here it is. And we were like, yay, you know, and people went by and they're like, me next, you know, and, and there was a poem there. I mean, that was uh, a poem. Right. Happiness, here, stand here. And I, so I have this great gang of undergraduates at Sarah Lawrence, and I'm going to ask them to be my guerrilla gang. And we want, in the spring, to go around and make these kinds of mm -hmm. um, chalk. I don't know if I should be saying this in public, because I figure it's not really vandalism if it's chalk. Because <laughs> right. you can wash it away, right? Mm -hmm. You can put anything on chalk. And so we're going to do some projects like that where mm. things happen in the public world. You've also written or talked about um, experiencing that, stu that students, which would be you know, people growing up now with all this technology, that, that texting, in fact, can be poetry. Oh, yeah. Twitter can be poetry. Yeah. And uh -huh. you really try to help them move into that space, right? Well, you know, in the, in the last couple of years, I, didn't, I still don't understand Twitter, I'm afraid. How many characters do you get in Twitter? Do 140. You, have, do you do Twitter? I just started about four months ago, and I love it. And I do, I do try to make it like poetry. In fact, I tweeted some lines of your poetry. You did yesterday, yeah. I really want to learn about this. Yeah. Um, but when what was it? Was it tweets? It must be tweets. One hundred and forty. 
They were telling me about it last spring, and I said, okay, everybody write a this, poem. This piece I read a minute ago, this is how things happen, cut by cut, familiar gesture after gesture. What else can we know of safety or fruitfulness? That fits into 140 characters, and a lot of people retweeted it. You're kidding. No, it's perfect. How amazing. It is amazing. Wow, this is it. This is what we're doing. So well, can you explain to me, maybe this isn't the moment, but how you tweet and then you get people who follow your tweets? Yeah. But what if no one wants to follow your tweets? Yeah, they will. They'll they follow just do. you. They'll, they will. So then you can actually send things out? You can send things out. Them? Yes, and they can send them around. And so it multiplies in the world. So I have to get the kids to help me with this. Yeah, you do. We'll do all the tweets. Yeah. Um, but they, yeah, they were writing. I said, this week, write a poem in 140 characters. And they were amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, um, yeah, I think there's a way we can use the technology to do that. I, I don't know. I, it's, I think that this, we could talk, uh, there should be conferences about how we're going to live in this new world with yeah. all this technology. I mean, you know, you can be really insipid in 140 characters, no doubt. But, but there, there is a, 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 there's something kindred in this. I mean, poetry has this virtue of brevity and economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the virtue. And how beautiful can you be? with how few words, and you, you can also do that with these new technologies, I think. It can, mm -hmm. it can force the same kind of discipline. Well, constriction, you mm -hmm. know, in form, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you convinced me. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wanted to talk to you. you. You actually brought this up a little while ago about, you, you've, you've talked about the silence at the center of every poem. Mm -hmm. I mean... And there was a place in when you wrote the introduction to in the company of solitude, which was other was writing about AIDS. Mm -hmm. You said, "How how do you anthologize silence? Mm. It's here too between the pages." Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I'd forgotten that the people who couldn't be there. Well, there's a silence at the center of everything, right? You know, um, maybe that's the thing we don't like. We're afraid of. That, that's, Maybe that's that, it. That silence in the center of everything. Well, Ash, what was it you said a minute ago that was so beautiful about? Oh, we were talking about the craziness, busyness. Mm -hmm. We don't have much practice at. We we we're not familiar with silence anymore. We don't know what to do we with it. We used to be. We used to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so recent, really. The mechanisms have brought all this noise into our world. I mean, a hundred years ago. Gas lamps, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, but the silence at the heart of everything has everything in it. It has our death, it has our life, mm. you know, and has the universes beyond this universe, the galaxies, it has the cricket, you know, it has everything in it. And the first time I've heard that kind of silence was this morning at Mark Conway's house. <laughs> I walked outside and Mm -hmm. You know, that snow, the silent, what Robert Bly called the silence of the snowy fields, mm. Minnesota, right? Um, that loud silence, bright, yeah. loud silence. Yeah, beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful, such a relief. Mm -hmm. You can just rest in it, you know. Mm. Um, but there's a way that, you know, the, uh, the machines, I, I love... Isaac Asimov and, and Arthur C. Clarke and all those old school science fiction writers. And remember all those books we read? Maybe you read when you were a kid. I did too. too. I loved all that stuff. I adored it. Yeah. And all about how the robots were going to take over and the machines were going to take over. And just last week it occurred to me, well, they have. It's just different from what we expected. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Joseph Brodsky, yeah, right. it's just different. Yeah. One of my teachers at Columbia was Joseph Brodsky, who's the Russian poet, wonderful, amazing poet, who was exiled from Russia, from the Soviet Union, um, for being a poet. And he said, looked at us one day, he, he disdained us completely. We, we had to memorize the 500 lines of poetry every week for him. He, was, he just thought American students were so lazy. Mm. Um, but he looked at us and he said, you, you Americans, you're so naive. You think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots. It doesn't come like that. Look at the language. It begins in the language. Mm. And I was thinking the machines, what do you look at more? What face do you look into more than any other face in your life? 
the face of my iPhone. Your screen, yeah. My screen. I gaze into that face. Mm -hmm. I do what it tells me to do. If, if aliens came down and saw us all walking around, <laughs> What would we, we do? We, all of us are walking around. Who do they obey? Looking into the, they, <laughs> right. oh, they had these, they, they serve these machines, you know. I mean, the machines rule us. I have no will when it comes to my machines. Because a computer, hours doing emails. I, I never applied for that job. What happened? It happened in 10 years, 15 years. They rule. They, they, they could just, it's a different, it's different from what we expected. So where do you find hope in this picture you have now of our life with machines? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this morning, you know, we have a new puppy. And so our friend Will s sent me a video he had taken of my daughter a minute before of running with the dog, you know, so I can see her in real time running with the dog, you know. That's sweet, you know. Um, all that is sweet. I, I, but I truly, I'm stumped. I don't know. I, 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 I feel I, I'm concerned. I, I'll be frank. I'm concerned. I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in, engaging with these machines. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't. And I feel like we're kind of reaching this pitch where a lot of us are coming to that conclusion. Yeah. And we don't want to do without them either. It's hard. We don't. We, and we don't even want to. I mean, there's so many great things it's about like it. It's like sugar. Yeah, right. It is. But it's kind sugar of this, can we some... learn to limit? Can we learn to be wise? But there's something about the dopamine. You know, they, oh, they yeah. learned about the, you know, when you check your mail, like anything could happen any minute. And yes. it pops in and yes, it pops yes. in your brain. I mean, there's a, it's a real addictive quality to it. And then, you know, we... We could talk at length about just pornography and what's mm -hmm. happening to pornography mm -hmm. in people mm -hmm. and the relationships they're having with themselves on it, through all that. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah. What about, I just heard you use that term, real time. Uh -huh. You know, is, <laughs> what is real time to ordinary time? I, real time is a new invented phrase. It's true. We didn't used to call it. We it's never like, talked about real time. It's like when you go to those restaurants and they say, Homemade food, <laughs> in quotes, right. homemade. That's right. It's like, well, isn't all food homemade? We actually homemade? cooked. Like, yeah, real time. It's true. Mm -hmm. There's this redundancy mm -hmm. that's happening now. Um, I, I, these are great questions. I think that many of us are used to being in several places at once and several time zones at once. I mean, that's just how we live now. Mm -hmm. We're separated. I just... Uh, so to be in real time is to be, I go like this and I kick your foot and you feel it, you know. I, yeah. You know, um, we actually touch each other. You speak, I listen, you, I talk back. I mean, I also, I also think real time is a way we talk about the news cycle, things happening in real time. Oh. But that's also stuff we need to shield ourselves from, right? It's not as, <laughs> I don't know, is real time as real as ordinary time? I mean, real time is pervasive and it's distracting. Well, so many thoughts at once. Um, ordinary time originally meant to me when I would go through the missile when I was a kid. Remember those swaths of time between the high holy seasons was ordinary time. Yes. And it was always coming. The coming of, or, coming of ordinary time, the coming of ordinary time, the coming of ordinary time, the first Sunday of ordinary time, second Sunday of ordinary time. I remember just thinking, oh, what a strange and wonderful way of talking about everyday life. And um, so this notion of like when well, nothing dramatic is happening, but this is where we're living. It's not Easter. It's not Christmas. It's not Lent. It's not Advent. Um, and then someone just sent me a book. Um, a Jungian uh, psychoanalyst has written a book, and it's called "The Dream of Totality." Where where are we when there is no center? Hmm. And she's talking in this book about um, the old gods are dead, you know, what used to be the place where we centered ourselves, you know, Eden, the Judeo-Christian god, the Greek gods, whatever. The old the gods are dead, pretty much. And there's this new, there's this new firmament, if you will, which is the World Wide Web. Um, and there's no center. 
There's no one in charge. Right. There's no deity. There's, there's no deity. Yeah. Uh, there's no... There's little authority. No even. authority. Very little authority. And uh, infinite possibilities. And um, I haven't, I'm so interested in what she's talking about because she's saying, well, then where are we? Who are we in relationship to this? And, um, and this, in fact, could be a replica of what we'll call the organism of Gaia, you know, of... We keep, you know, we're finally beginning to see that we're not us and earth and us and animals, that mm -hmm. we're all one interdependent organism, and that this could be part of a larger, 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 you know. Right. Um, I say larger, but whatever that means when we get to that kind of thing. And that this web thing is what people are realizing is actually already existing in some way. Um, but where are we in relationship to it? And uh, who are we? And who are we to each other, and um, she's raising wonderful questions. So this notion of real time, oh, and then, I'll, I, anyway, I, I keep wishing, I keep going back to Marshall McLuhan, who we, you know, who came to our house once, and we were talking, we read of so much in the 60s about when he said, you know, a TV is not just a moving picture, you know, and a car is not just a fast horse. I mean, the medium itself is the message, it's not content and how hard that was to understand when he was beginning to say that. Like, huh, huh, huh? Right, you know, I just right, couldn't right. get it. Like, it took me years to finally understand that the medium itself. So now, you know, we, we watch, like, I can't watch this film, but Zero Dark Thirty, where your people go in and they kill each other with, you know, it looks like video games. And it seems to me, how do we how do we experience this amazing web while also retaining a sense of personal responsibility and relationship? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Right, and in previous generations, I mean, certainly, like in a in a Catholic world you grew up in, where there were all kinds of rules and hierarchies and roles, mm -hmm. and you might the role might have been too small, it might have been constricting, it might have been mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. But it's given to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some ways, if we can crack this, right? Mm -hmm. If we can, if we can really take responsibility and create roles and hierarchies that are that make sense. Well, can there be a hierarchy again with the worldwide web? right, or whatever it is, whatever whatever succeeds hierarchy? And what's going to happen really when the hackers really do get into the big grids? Yeah. Well, there you go. There's some. <laughs> You know, I mean, that, that strikes me as, mm -hmm. that'll be the next big thing, don't mm -hmm. you think? Mm -hmm. When that really happens. Yeah. Because um, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then when we, that begins to happen, and then you have anonymous people who have power. Right. Um, well, the anonymous people do have power now, but they know who they are. And, but a different anonymous group is going to have a different kind of power. It's mm -hmm. going to be very interesting. It's yeah. really right out of Arthur C. Clarke. Yes, um, it is. I was gonna, it's <laughs> what he would have, might have written if he'd known what would come. In. Uh -huh. So there's something you wrote, I mean, just on this idea of who we are, identity. I want to ask what you meant by this. Um, or this was in an interview. You said, I still believe in the soul, even if I don't believe in identity. Oh, gosh, what a thing to say. <laughs> I don't know what I meant. <laughs> I don't even know what I mean by soul. I don't know. Mm. I really don't know anymore. Identity means less and less to me. What means less and less? Identity. Mm. Maybe that's growing older. Um, do you feel that way? If there's a way that... Um, Less and less and less. I have less need, as I grow older, to pin things down and tie them up. Or to um, assert oneself, one's identity mm -hmm. in the world. Um, to be transparent would be nice. To move through the world transparently. I would, that would be a relief. Um, but I don't know about the soul. I don't know, any about, I don't know anything about that. All I know is that some things have happened that I don't understand, you know. And they're the, real, they're the most true things I've known. Hmm. Hmm. That's all, that's finally all I can say. I mean, some things have happened that I don't understand that feel like the most important things that have ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. 
Some people I know have called you a religious poet. Oh, that's funny. And I don't, I don't see you that way because, well, maybe this is related to what you were just saying about identity seeming less important. Um, I think to label you a religious poet is to put you in a box. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, the way religion or the soul comes into your poetry actually kind of takes it out of that box and put it back, puts it back into life. Yeah. Right? Do yeah. You? Like, I feel, um, I don't, well, religious isn't a word I really relate to, organized religion at all. Um, I'm interested in the metaphysical, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I have been writing a book of prose, which is very interesting because it's, really hard to do. Are you writing a book of prose? Did I hear this? I am. It's a bit torture. Is it a torture? Yeah, I don't. It's like, I'm at the point where I, was, I don't think I will be able to do it, and, and maybe I won't, but I also have done this enough to know that there's, you always, always get into that, that stage. Right. But it's, I'd love to read it. No fun. I'd love to read well, it. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'd we love can help for you each to be other. a reader, yeah. Um, because I feel the same way. I feel like many, many times I come to that place where I just feel like the house of cards falls and falls mm -hmm. down, and, and I think, why? Why even do this? Right. Um, what are you writing about? There are enough about? books. There are enough books. Right. Well, kind of what we've been talking about, actually. I um, started with writing essays about my daughter and I, and, um, uh, Really, essentially, so much of it is, I used to think this, but now I, now I don't. Or, I, I was really wrong about that, too. <laughs> or, um, a, lot, a, lot of, an awful lot of the essays have that, have that aspect to them. Look how wrong I was. Um, uh, but it's about my family growing up, but also about raising my daughter uh, as an only child in a very different kind of community. Um, about home, looking for home, being at home, being in the, being a, longing for home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. I have this, in writing this book, I thought of this earlier. I remember the first poem I ever wrote when I was about seven years old, and I gave it to my father. I think I put it on my wall, and it's four lines, sort of like Emily. Do you Dickinson. remember it? Yeah, I do. I just, I just put it in a little essay. It goes, I have a little house to clean. It's not so very small. Get that, get that little turn, isn't that good? It's, I have a little house to clean. <laughs> it's not so very small. You don't need a mop or broom. You just need grace. That's all. So I told this to my therapist when I was like, you know, my 50s. And he said, the house is your vagina. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it's my soul. <laughs> okay. And he said, it's your vagina. Isn't that funny? He was wrong, wasn't he? <laughs> well, just so I'm thinking of calling the book The Little House. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Finding mm -hmm. a Little House. But The Little House, um, uh, vagina, soul, vagina, soul, sister, mother. I, I don't know. It could, vagina, soul. And as a woman, too, um, and to be embodied woman, person in this world, it seems that more and more this book is turning into something about trying to find, I don't want this to sound too goofy, but you know, the deep feminine um, in the world, hmm. you know, in myself, in my daughter, which I'm beginning to honor more and more and more too. And the thing is, you know, what does that mean, right? Saying what that means, because, because that, phrase, the deep feminine, or just the word feminine, Yeah. again, it's not something that is definable anymore. It's not in a box. Well, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't mean, when I say the deep feminine, I don't mean women as opposed to men, mm -hmm, of course. Mm -hmm. we just have, that has to be said. I mean, Mark has the deep feminine, yes, you know, yes. Mark Conway. Um, they're beautiful men who have that developed in them beautifully, but and women who don't, you know, I was so male identified for so many years. Um, but I feel more, more and more that it's, you know, relational, it's intuitive, it's love over justice, you know. Um, um, it's many of the parables we grew up with. Um, and it's back to those nuns in the beginning, you know, who could look out from their faces. They weren't, they didn't experience themselves as objects, but as subjects of their own life. Um, women who 
who could do light in every day, who, I mean, you know, they had their problems like everybody else, but um, just somehow, and also non-hierarchical, you know, so the planet and the earth and the little bugs and the puppies and, the, you know, the dolphins were all, you know, what, what you were just saying about the elephants and, mm-hmm. you know, we're no longer lord of, of all, you know, that we are companions to each other, mm-hmm. help helpmates to each other. Um, mm, I like that. You know, on the planet. I mean, I, I think, uh, so helpmate is that, or is that, is language from Genesis. I mean, I think sometimes the reason people have called you a religious poet is because you do work with a lot of religious imagery and stories and characters. Well, I've started writing the voice of Mary Magdalene. That's the most recent work. Um, I actually want to leave you this latest poem, and it's called Mar- Magdalene and the Seven Demons. But she sounds like someone who lives now. Um, mm-hmm. I love Magdalene, and I think of her as someone who really struggled with her subjectivity, too, and came into it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, found herself. Um, uh, found herself uh, as a subject of her life. And... I, I'm fascinated by her as a woman who's lived over centuries, you yes. know, centuries and centuries. And been interpreted and reinterpreted over centuries. And unfortunately, by the wrong gender, um, because, you know, the projections put on her um, out of, well, we could psychoanalyze that forever. It'd be fascinating, <laughs> you know, why she had to be made into this A prostitute. Person, right? right. And instead of a woman who was standing there and open and could see and was interested mm-hmm. and alive and relational. Um, but she, uh, I think of her as like that, that girl who was shot on the bus, you know? In I India, think of or, no. Malaya, Malaya, what's her beautiful name? That little girl in uh, the Taliban. Oh, in, yes, in uh, Afghanistan. Yeah, right. who, who, you know, or the, just so many are the women in Congo, you know, or... A woman in the AMP in, in the United States right now, you know, who's just lonely and it's Thursday and she's buying progresso lentil soup. Um, you know, um, I just love her. I think of her as that, that woman who many, over many, many, many centuries. Um, mm. uh, well, do you want to read that? It's Can kind, you? It's Is kind it? of long. I don't know. Um, well, it's funny to me because I just saw the first line. It's, you tell me. Oh, yeah, it is long. Well, do you want to read? I'll read part parts of, it. of it. Yeah, just read parts of it. Dip into it. Actually, the only thing written about Magdalene in the New Testament, as far as I could see, was in Luke. And it says, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven devils had been cast out. So this is Magdalene talking about those seven devils. The first was that I was very busy. The second, I was different from you. Whatever happened to you could not happen to me. Not like that. The third, I worried. The fourth, envy, disguised as compassion. The fifth was that I refused to consider the quality of life of the aphid. The aphid disgusted me, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. The mosquito, too, its face, and the ant, its bifurcated body. Okay, the first was that I was so busy. The second, that I might make the wrong choice because I had decided to take that plane that day, that flight before noon, so as to arrive early, and I shouldn't have wanted that. The third was that if I walked past a certain place on the street, the house would blow up. The fourth was that I was made of guts and blood with a thin layer of skin lightly thrown over the whole thing. The fifth was that the dead seemed more alive to me than the living. The sixth, if I touched my right arm, I had to touch my left arm. And if I touched the left arm a little harder than I'd first touched the right, then I had to retouch the left and then touch the right again so it would be even. The seventh, I knew I was breathing the expelled breath of everything that was alive and I couldn't stand it. I wanted a sieve, a mask, a... I hate this word, a cheesecloth to breathe through that would trap it, whatever was inside everyone else that entered me when I breathed in. No, that was the first one. 
The second was that I was so busy. I had no time. How had this happened? How had our lives gotten like this? The third was that I couldn't eat food if I really saw it distinct, separate from me in a bowl or on a plate. Okay. The first was that I could never get to the end of the list. The second was that the laundry was never finally done. The third was that no one knew me, although they thought they did, and that if people thought of me as little as I thought of them, then what was love? The fourth was that I didn't belong to anyone. I wouldn't allow myself to belong to anyone. The fifth was that I knew none of us could ever know what we didn't know. The sixth was that I projected onto others what I, myself, was feeling. The seventh was the way my mother looked when she was dying, the sound she made, her mouth wrenched to the right and cupped open so as to take in as much air, the gurgling sound, so loud we had to speak louder to hear each other over it, and then I couldn't stop hearing it years later, grocery shopping, crossing the street. No, not the sound. It was her body's hunger, finally evident, what our mother had hidden all her life. For months, I dreamt of knuckle bones and roots, the slabs of sidewalk pushed up like crooked teeth by what grew underneath. The underneath, that was the first devil. He was always with me. And that I didn't think you, if I told you, would understand any of this. Mm. That's great. You've just written that? Yeah. Oh. It's fabulous. I'm glad you like it. I, I like her so much. <laughs> I like it. I hear myself reflected. Yeah, which me is, too. Of course, the point. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. And that she's, those are her devils, no different mm -hmm. from ours, mm -hmm. do you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I love her because she's us, you know? And I feel like all those characters were us, mm -hmm. are us, you know? Um, and you're right, there's something in that Mary Magdalene character and how she got embellished and how it was read between the lines who she was, but but that dilemma that we all have of never really being known and... No, oh, I know. Right, that disconnect between who we think we are and maybe who we really are and who mm -hmm. other people and see us really as and us. the anguish of... Those disconnects. Can we be ever really be seen? Yeah. I think the thing of Jesus, I mean, he must have been like this, as Buddha must have been, and all these great enlightened ones. But he must have been able to really see people, mm -hmm. you know? And, and people didn't feel ashamed mm. in front of him mm. and um, in, in relationship to him. They didn't seem ashamed. And they're constantly screwing up. I mean, all those guys were constantly. <laughs> That's up. right. It's true. They sh actually, I think they should have been a little bit more. I ashamed. know. Me too. <laughs> Especially the garden thing. <laughs> yes. The third time. <laughs> yeah. But but you know, no one seems to feel ashamed uh, in relationship to him, and that's a remarkable quality to have. Um, and uh, she was in relationship to him too, and didn't have that. Uh, so. Well, you know, Seamus Heaney has that beautiful, I mean, leaping a little bit, but Seamus has a beautiful, I want to say it's a, p a prose piece about um, when Jesus, when the woman is brought, and now we know because we've seen, witnessed, we've witnessed it in the countries we've been occupying, um, when a woman is brought out to be stoned, um, and they, they say to Jesus, you know, so this is the law, what do you think? And he leans down and he writes in the sand. Seamus said, that's poetry. Mm. Whatever he was writing. Mm. Mm. And that mm. in between, when he leans down and writes with his finger in the sand, and then looks up and says, whoever's without sin, you cast the first stone. And everybody walks away. And, and then, then she says, and he says, where'd everybody go? And she says, they left. And he said, I don't judge you either. You know? And that seems to settle it for me. I mean, he says, me either. I'm not without sin. You know? Right. Um, but if that were Mary, what a relief to look into someone's face to say that. 
you know, and now we know that she could have been actually raped and brought to, forward to be stoned. I mean, mm -hmm. what's happening? Hmm. You, um, well, let me just, I want, I want to read, I want you to read some more poetry. I don't know where I got this. I usually try to be careful with my notes. This is something you wrote or said, maybe in another interview. I was a little nervous about that because you never know for sure that yeah. what gets reported. But, but it sounds like the kind of thing you would say, that art helps us to let our heart break open rather than close. Yeah. And I just wonder how you reflect on, because uh, we've talked about your childhood and families and families of origin and and then going through life and becoming a poet and becoming a mother rather late in life. And mm -hmm. how do you think the stakes of that art helping hel helping us let our heart break open? How the form and the stakes of that are different at different points have been different different at different points in your life and maybe in all of our lives. Well, that's that's one of the only choices that we have, right? I mean, things are going to happen all the time. The unendurable happens. You know, people we love and we can't live without are going to die. We're going to die one day. We're going to have to leave our children and die. You know, leave the plants and the bunnies and <laughs> the sunlight and the rain and all that. I mean, it's un unendurable. Poet art knows that. Art holds that knowledge. All art holds the knowledge that we're both living and dying at the same time. It can hold it. And thank God it can, because nothing out in the capitalistic corporate world is going to shine that back to us. But art holds it. And I think the, one of the only choices we have is, you know, are you, you going to... I remember when John died, you know, um, I realized it's small. I mean, people suffer. People are suffering now, an endurable suffering, way beyond what I did. Right this minute, someone's in a, in a prison being tortured. And they're for no reason. Um, so I don't know how I would live through that. I don't, without going psychotic. Um, but, but I did know that when John died, I thought, OK, I can either just let this crack my heart open or closed. And, and open, the good news about open is you know, I turned around, and there were, of course, the billion other people who have lived on this earth who have lost the person they love so much. And there they all were. And it was so great to be in their company, you know? And, and, uh, and alternatively, the day I said to my daughter, for the first and maybe only time, when she was four years old, I remember where I was standing in Austin, Texas, making a bed, and she said, why do I have to do it? And I said, because I said so. <laughs> and, and I turned around, and there they all were again. <laughs> there were like millions of people going, you know, yeah, we said it too. <laughs> and I'm like, hi, everybody. I just joined you. <laughs> and they were like, welcome. And I just laughed. I'm like, I can't believe I just said that. And she was four. She's like, mm. I'm like, <laughs> there were all these people there. I was so glad to be with them. Mm. Um, so I think that... Um, we join each other, you know. It's like the great story about Buddha and the woman who comes with her dead baby. You know, you know this story, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And says she won't let it be buried, she won't let it be burned. She says, "My child is dead, and help me, help me, and help me." And he says, "Go into town and find a house where no one has died." And of course, she goes, and there's not a single home where no one has died. And so, the more we can identify with each other, you know the better it is. It's just easier. We're, we're, we're not alone. And I feel like that's, 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 the, that's the only answer. Otherwise, we just think it's only happening to us. And that's a terrible and, and untrue way to live our lives. And I think art constantly mirrors that to us, whether you're reading Thomas Hardy or Doris Lessing or Virginia Woolf or Emily Dickinson. You know, it's just holding the human story is up to us, and we don't feel alone. Mm. Mm. It's so miraculous, you know. Emily Dickinson wrote those amazing poems. You know, I felt a funeral in my brain, and mourners to and fro kept treading, treading, until it seemed that sense was breaking through. And my students were all like, huh? I'm like, who here has had a panic attack? And like half the room raised their hand. I'm like, okay, now read it, you know. 
And then a plank and reason broke and I dropped down and down and hit a world with every plunge and finished knowing. Then, you know, they're all like, whoa. I'm like, okay, imagine acute anxiety, you know. And she, but she did it. She wrote it. She domesticated it for us. She found the language for it. So when it happens to us, you know, we're not alone. Hmm. Um, it's shared. And everything's shared. It's better. That's great. Thank you. Would you read a few poems? Sure. Um, so there were a few that you mentioned, like a hurry. I mean, mm -hmm. you actually kind of told it. Mm -hmm. But I'd love to hear you read that one. I like that. Um, <laughs> and prayer, which are all in here. Mm -hmm. There's, <laughs> I'll tell you one that I really love, mm. Death, The Last Visit. Which oh, I'm so glad you like that But we couldn't poem. possibly put it on public radio. I just want you to know I like it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> okay. That was the first poem I ever had published, and it was in The Atlantic. The Atlantic took it. What Peter Davison wrote and said, we like to keep Death, The Last Visit, but you'll forgive me if I ask you to do something about that in the third stanza. <laughs> Our readers have never heard that word, but in reference to a bird or a barrel. And so for weeks, I tried to think of another word. And Stanley Kunitz actually helped me find it. And he said the word is part. Really? You'll taste your favorite salty part. <laughs> well, I liked it the way it was. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, OK, well, here's prayer. Here's, here's the fear. Here's the fear we were talking about, the fear mm -hmm. of poetry, the fear of the silence, the fear of being able to be still how unendurable it can be. Prayer. Every day I want to speak with you, and every day something more important calls for my attention. The drugstore, the beauty products, the luggage I need to buy for the trip. Even now, I can hardly sit here among the falling piles of paper and clothing, the garbage trucks outside already screeching and banging. The mystics say, you are as close as my own breath. Why do I flee from you? My days and nights pour through me like complaints and become a story I forgot to tell. Help me. Even as I write these words, I am planning to rise from the chair as soon as I finish this sentence. Yeah. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where's hurry? This is a, this is a poem I feel a little ashamed of. And I adopted I adopted Inan when she was three, from China, and I swear for the first two months, every bruise on her body inadvertently came from me because I hadn't. She hadn't entered into my physical circle of awareness, so I was always walking through doors that would bang into her, and she'd fall down. <laughs> I, mean, I was always going through revolving doors, and she'd be like, mm, you know. <laughs> if you could have, a, we could have a, a little video of our first few months, <laughs> it would be horrifying. And how, you were in your 50s, right? I was 52, yeah. yeah. She's, hmm. you know, she's such a wonderful person. She saved my life, but hmm. she... Um, this is, this is such an example of her being my spiritual teacher. Hurry. We stop at the dry cleaners and the grocery store and the gas station and the green market and hurry up, honey, I say. Hurry, hurry, as she runs along two or three steps behind me, her blue jacket unzipped and her socks rolled down. Where do I want her to hurry to? To her grave? To mine? where one day she might stand all grown. Today, when all the errands are finally done, I say to her, honey, I'm sorry I keep saying hurry. You walk ahead of me. You be the mother. And hurry up, she says over her shoulder, looking back at me, laughing. Hurry up now, darling, she says. Hurry, hurry, taking the house keys from my hands. <laughs> I love that. It's true. What would you like to read? 
There's so, there's this line. I just this is a line from the Good Thief was what I started with, and so I had all the. I just mm-hmm. you know, really fell in love with it, and I know those are. I think mm-hmm. those are older for mm-hmm. you. Um, sorrow. So yeah. now it has our complete attention, and we are made whole. Mm-hmm. Just that line was fabulous. That's absolutely tweetable. Uh-huh. I, I will tweet <laughs> tweetable. it later today. Well, it's that same idea, right? That finally mm-hmm. we're stopped long enough to feel ourselves alive. Um, well, there's a series in here that's in the voice of Mary, mother of Jesus. Um, and I love her. She, she was sort of the reason I wrote all those Christmas plays. Yeah, right. Because um, she, well, have you read the column, column Tolbin's Testament of Mary? It just think came so. out. It's interesting. It's new. Very new, okay. yeah. It's about to be a one-woman show with Fiona Shaw on Broadway. Mm. Um, but um, So these were all 14-line poems where Mary was talking. And, um, and I wrote about four of them, and I wanted to show them to Stanley Kunitz, who was my friend for many years. And he said, now you must write about the Annunciation. I said, <laughs> sure. Um, OK, I'll try. And I wrote many poems that I threw away. And maybe not many, but three or four. And they were just, and then this poem came through. So um, it had nothing to do with me. So I, I like to read it. Um, and it's her talking about that visit. Even if I don't see it again, nor ever feel it, I know it is, and that if once it hailed me, it ever does. And so it is myself I want to turn in that direction, not as towards a place, but it was a tilting within myself as one turns a mirror to flash the light to where it isn't. I was blinded like that and swam in what shone at me only able to endure it by being no one. And so, specifically myself, I thought I'd die from being loved like that. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. It has.